Dr. Edward Tan is a trauma surgeon and associate professor and the former chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. He is the medical director on disaster preparedness and a lieutenant colonel of the Royal Netherlands Army. He will be giving us a talk on the management of the polytrauma patient in extremists and mass casualty incidents preparedness. Professor Tan, please. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about mass casualty uh, incidents preparedness and the management of the polytrauma patient in extremes. So you have to consider that um, we all can handle one patient who will come in shot or either involved in a blast. When you cannot handle it, you can ask, of course, some colleagues. But it will be different if there are two patients showing up at the same time or even four patients showing up at the same time. Then you may have encounter a mass casualty. And a mass casualty incident is an event that overwhelms your local healthcare system where the number of casualty exceeds your local resources. So it's very depending where you work and what time you work. And I can say you, our experience is very limited in the Netherlands. Because I will take um, my experience from my military deployments to, um, to Afghanistan 15 years ago. I uh, was working in the south of um, uh, Afghanistan in Uruzgan, which was a single surgeon mission. So during that time, I treated a lot of patients who actually arrived at the same time. So we had some minor mass calls at that time. The same accounts actually for Kandahar. I was working there in a rural tree hospital that was 13 years ago. Um, we had two surgical teams there. So one Dutch surgical team and two, well, actually one Canadian team consisting of a general surgeon and orthopedic surgeon. And at a certain moment, we got a pre-announcement that one helicopter was coming, or actually two helicopters were coming with a lot of casualties after a bombardment. So we didn't know exactly how many, but uh, because we got a pre-announcement in time, we succeeded in getting all surgical teams and all medical personnel um, to the hospital. And what you can see in front of the hospital that there is a triage and the triage is done by one of our experienced physicians. And then after that, we had um, teams appointed to at least consisting of one, uh, one doctor and one nurse treating all those patients. And I have a small movie about it, a clip. Yeah. So, What's very important, it seems like chaos considering the sound, but it's very important to have command and control. So all those um, uh, ER rooms give feedback to the uh, clinical lead. And we used the whiteboard. So we had eight casualties. So they identified with a bracelet. And on the whiteboard, we have what's their injury and what are we going to do with it? Are we going to take them to OR, going to take them to the ICU, or do they have to be admitted? So what is, very, what, what is very important is that um, you should have command and control on a clinical need so that he or she can um, manage all resources and staff and equipment. So if you look at all MASCALs, and these slides are taken from the WHO MASCAL management course, we know that in a MASCAL patient, if you have 100 patients, 80% have mild injuries. And from these 20% will be severely injured, but you must, um, you must know uh, that those 20% will consume 80% of your resources. So it's very important that you focus on correct triage of your patients and of course manage your staff equipment and supplies. So I'm going to take you now to the Netherlands. I'm talking to you from Nijmegen, which is in the east. And our previous speaker, Ken, has been a frequent visitor of Nijmegen because we organized there the DSCC course. Um, actually, the Netherlands is very densely populated with 17 million inhabitants, uh, very nearby the German border, actually, and also very nearby Ukraine. You already mentioned it, uh, one of the other uh, moderators. It's only 2,000 kilometers away uh, from uh, our border, so you can drive in two days to the border of Ukraine, perhaps in one day if you drive very fast. So. The Netherlands is very sophisticated, highly dense um, populated, and I will take you in some uh, incidents what happened. Um, we had a big fire um, and an explosion of a factory, 
actually, which was downtown a city in the year of 2000, and we had a lot of casualties. And these were all distributed to a low uh, level one trauma center, which was situated in that city. But the good thing is Nijmegen of the Netherlands is very densely populated, and there are also 10 level one trauma centers in the vicinity. So all that patient could be distrib distributed to all other hospitals. So yes, there was a mass scale in that local hospital, in a local level one, but the other hospitals could take a lot of amount of those patients. Well, terrorist attack we um, also have uh, in the Netherlands. And this is also quite a little bit unique for the Netherlands, flooding, because sometimes hospitals are built um, within the vicinity of a river and you can have high tides. And if it's too high, well, we have to evacuate the hospital. Uh, so that's a kind of mass scale, but different. And also in Amsterdam, we have two level one trauma centers and they did some construction work. And what happened, um, they got some flooding. Well, people are walking there and you can cycle, but the problem was all technical equipment was situated in the basement. So we had a complete power failure of that hospital. So almost 300 patients had to be evacuated outside. So it's a reverse mass scale, actually. Of course, chemical disaster is a point in which you have to put there. And also IT, uh, we are very depending of IT. And um, if IT is not working, actually in the Netherlands, you cannot do anything. And uh, we had one IT outage and we had to close down our ER for several hours before, because nothing worked. So, the experience concerning mass casualty is very limited. So, and how do we have to prepare as a level one Radboud hospital? Um, well, first of all, you have to have some kind of crisis management structure. Um, this is by the way, our level one trauma center and there are new buildings. Um, and these are uh, what you can see on the slides, the actual the amount of casualties, which you can see in one hour. And these are guaranteed uh, T1 or P1, you, uh, in other countries use the P1 uh, um, triage method. Uh, we use in the Netherlands the T classification. So T1 is vitally impaired and T2 are, um, in, well, they're imminent impaired, um, which also means we, we can run at least four ORs at the same time, even at Christmas Eve or during the four days walk, uh, which is a very big event in Nijmegen. Um, considering this, how do we, how is our experience with mass scales? Well, we had one uh, five years ago, which was just a regular burn in a nursing home, but the problem was we didn't get a pre-announcement. So when we got the pre-announcement, the first patients already arrived at the ER. So at that time, that team there was completely overwhelmed with four T1 casualties uh, at that same time. But uh, we managed of course to handle it. So how do we prepare? And I will show you how we have done it in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. So we have a very good dispatch center, which steers the ambulance services. And in normal times, the ambulance services will give us an update or a pre-announcement to our triage nurse. And the triage nurse will check all the information, discuss it with the ER physician, and then declare a mass casualty. Then we have a one uh, we have a computer which can send out uh, 300 lines at the same time. So we can get everybody alerted, which we will need during a mass scale. Of course, you can read the slides that uh, the ER is uh, wiped clean, equipment is checked, uh, elective OR stop, outpatient stop. And of course, our staff is allocated to the right area. And what's more importantly, our crisis command structure will start. Because in normal times, we have a board of directors who will manage the hospital. But in crisis, you will need like a military structure. So what we have done is we have a crisis command team, which consists of one chair, one coordinator, and one press officer. And if necessary, we have four coordinators also. So, uh, and that are the operational teams, for instance, for patient care, for facility and equipment, for infection, and for IT. And when we have a, a full scale uh, crisis, all these um, structures are operational. But what's important, and hopefully um, you can do with something with these information, you, you will need some kind of military structure. So not a normal structure, but a military structure who can make decisions what to do in a crisis. Uh, for instance, if you get a pre-announcement of a mass scale coming in, of course the T1 and T2 uh, patients or P1 or P2 to will go to the ER. Walking patients uh, will go to our outpatient clinic, which is another building. 
um, dead patients or expectant uh, dead patients will go to the morgue and expectant patients, if we know that, well, we cannot save them, will go to another area. And two things are important that, of course, when something happens, a lot of press will come. So the, we have a, a press center which is situated here. And family members will start searching for their relatives. So we have a family reunion center opposite of the hospital. Triage is important, as I mentioned before. So triage will be pre-hospital done by our ER, oh, sorry, by our uh, pre-hospital nurses. We have uh, pre, uh, nurses working pre-hospitally. So it's very simple. Uh, every patient will get a bracelet. Uh, a white bracelet consists of name uh, and uh, birthday. And the other colored bracelet is the triage coach, which, the, uh, which they receive. They are vitally impaired or they can be walking, then it's green. And when those patients arrive at our hospital, a secondary triage will take place at the entrance of the ambulance hall and um, uh, of, of the ER. And again, it's a quick triage. It's the walking patient, then it's the T3 or P3, and they go to the outpatient clinic. It's the T1 or T2, they will go to the ER. And again, identification is essential. So uh, you can see at the entrance of the ER, they will get another bracelet. That's the bracelet of our hospital. Um, so then we know who is who, and uh, that's especially useful for family reunion, for instance. And of course, like a lot of hospitals, we're using uh, some kind of electronic patient file system. And we have a, a, a switch knot uh, which can switch the um, electronic patient file. It's from the firm Epic uh, in a disaster mode, which makes things quicker. So, of course, in the ER, it's very important quick resuscitation only necessary examination to focus on the well-known ABCD ATLS protocol. And after that, um, they either go to the OR, they go to the ICU, to the outpatient or palliative area or the morgue. And we will have in our ER three resuscitation rooms and they can be fitted with complete trauma teams consisting of all those people you see on the photo. And we have 15 normal rooms. And it's just a quick pit stop approach, just a quick uh, resuscitation uh, and assessment and then we have to decide what to do with that patient. Uh, important, as you have seen uh, previously in that other movie from Afghanistan, you will need a clinical lead who has command and control, who knows how many patients are there, who knows the prioritization, which patient goes to first to OR or to the ICU, and he will give or she will, will give feedback to the crisis command team. Do we need some resources? Do we need additional equipment? Do we need personnel? I have a very small movie about one minute. Uh, shows you an exercise. <laughs> Yeah, at 10 o'clock the, the exercise ended, but what I want to show you is that it's very important that you train your personnel that they do know what to do in case of a mass scale. And if you do not train, the people don't know what to do. So we train every four years with a big exercise and we do yearly small exercise and training in so that people know what to do in case of a mass scale. Um, considering operation, well, um, Ken uh, Buffett already mentioned that it's very important um, that, uh, well, in the ER, of course, um, control of major bleeding and surgical airway, but in the OR, we will apply damage control surgery principles, which mean life and if possible, limb-saving surgery. So stop the bleeding, stop the contamination, uh, short procedures, no uh, closure of the abdomen. Um, uh, you can uh, switch to damage control orthopedics, damage control neurosurgery, and consider it's a staged approach. So quick surgery, and after that, they either go to the ICU or to the ward. And if we have more time, uh, and if we know how many patients uh, will be coming or we over the top of our search of patients, then perhaps you can take them back to the OR and uh, do the definitive surgery. 
But if you do not know and you're still in a mass scale situation, short procedures, life and limb saving surgery, applied damage control. In the late phase, you have time to do um, vascular repair. Uh, you can treat a suspected hollow fiscus injury or do some debridement or plastic procedure or surgical burn care. So, and you, you will be thinking, well, is that hospital prepared? Well, as the whole world was overwhelmed with the COVID pandemics, uh, also in the Netherlands, um, we were overwhelmed with the pandemic of COVID and you can see it in the figure. Normally, in normal times, we have 1150 ICU beds in the Netherlands and we had to crank it up to 1600. And what I want to mention is that the crisis command structure took over the hospital in that time when we were overwhelmed with all the COVID patients and the whole crisis management was operating and it showed that it worked. So training works, prepare, uh, preparing for the unexpected works because it's very, well, what we do, we, we try to prepare, but you cannot prepare for the unexpected. So that's the issue. Well, just some uh, final uh, remarks, future development. Communication is essential because you have to know what is coming and what's not coming. So we use, an, we have uh, developed an application for our smartphones and which consists of which you can read the crisis report. Uh, you can read also the communication from the ambulances already. So we know what is coming. Um, the other thing is, um, well, COVID showed us that we need additional ICU capacity, not only on the recovery or the OR, but also in other buildings, especially when something will happen to an ICU and you have to move those patients. So we have made um, the possibility with technical equipment and a connection and oxygen that um, if something will happen to our current ICU units or if um, we have a surge of another COVID pandemics, uh, the fifth or sixth or seventh wave, we can have more ICU capacity. Um, finally, um, in normal times, um, suspected patients with infectious diseases such as Ebola or Lassa will go to our ER and then to the high, high level infection unit. So they have to be transported to the whole hospital. Well, we thought that's not that clever. So what we've done, we built a high level infection unit at the corner of a hospital. So actually outside with a separate entrance. So when we have a suspected Ebola patient or other contagious disease, they can go directly to the high level infection unit. Yearly training, I already told you, it's very important that your personnel knows what to do during mass care. So in summary, well, we try to prepare for the unexpected. It's very, very important to implement and train your personnel. And considering the treatment of the patient and extremists, either young or old, well, in the mass care situation, apply damage control principles. Well, thank you for uh, the invitation and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all from the Netherlands.